Reptiles don't have emotions, right? Surely they react to just primal instincts. As long as they're eating, shedding and pooping, everything's fine. People saying this might not have known that they weren't right, but it's still harmfully untrue to say that reptiles don't have a conscious effect on the world around them. Stereotypically, people think that reptiles are primitive creatures. Some of this stems from the socio-zoological scale. This is a theory developed by Arnold Arluk and Clinton Sanders in 1996. They stated that in the view of the generalised humanity, animals are scaled by a ranking of their place in our society, rather than as individually evolved species. They did this using four domains. Friends and tools, including animals that have companion use, such as cats, dogs, or beneficial use, such as horses, pigs, and cows. Then vermin and demons, including rodents, invertebrates, herptiles, and any animals considered dangerous or filthy. The basis of this is that we view animal mind complexity by their similarities to us. There are a multitude of things that affect this, such as personal experience, cultural and religious influence, what animals you spent time with at various ages, and how they were used. Dr. Ken Shapiro worded this well. We deny species their being through reference to animals based on their function from a human point of view. Pet animals, lab animals, farm animals. Animals at the top of this scale are viewed as more complex, more intelligent, more deserving of privileges not only directly, but in how we see their cognition, the way that we think they think. The issue here is that reptiles are viewed pretty low on this scale. They are seen as not intelligent, low and unevolved life forms. But having an evolutionary history that stretches back hundreds of millions of years does not imply simplicity. In fact, that gives these species their incredible range of forms, behaviours and intelligence. We innately believe that reptiles are simple creatures. Another problem is how we view brains, including our own. You may have seen images like this before, segmenting the human brain into separate areas that evolved at different times. A simple, innate reptile brain considered to govern instinctual base primal behaviours, the limbic brain governing emotions, feelings, and the neocortex governing rational thought, the thinking brain. Paul Maclean first proposed this idea in 1957, asserting that the deeper systems were older and stem from primordial primitive animals in our far evolutionary past. Then shallower areas, such as the limbic brain and neocortex, stem from more recently in our evolutionary path, such as with the rise of primates. This idea tells us that reptiles don't have the outer advanced, more recently evolved brain structures that allow for complex behaviours and concepts. And when you compare how a human and reptile brain looks, it makes sense. However, Despite the McLean model spreading worldwide as the accepted logic at the time, and still ingrained today, science is a constantly evolving thing. The more we find out, the more questions we have to ask, the closer we get to the truth. There is a concept in Scientometrics called the half-life of knowledge. This is the time it takes within an area of knowledge for half of the facts to be superseded by more accurate new facts. In psychology, it has been shown that the half-life of knowledge is an average of seven years, and in some subparts as low as 3.3 years. So why do we hold aged concepts so closely to our hearts? and refuse to consider that we simply don't know enough to make accurate calls on this yet. Back to the brain. The McLean model doesn't hold up under the results and methodology of modern studies, and critics increasingly show that we simply don't yet understand the complexity of these animals, and won't until we know everything about their biology, their neurology, and how all of these structures truly communicate. The reptile brain looks simple, especially when visually compared to known complex versions of brains like our own, or 
birds. Hold on. Birds are intelligent. Birds all form complex behaviours, complex attachments, and can even solve puzzles and use language, perform incredible migrations, parental care and teaching. Why does it look so much like a reptile brain? It is similarly shaped. This part isn't all wrinkly. Isn't that what people say shows intelligence? Something about surface area? Well, yes and no. Correlations have been made between surface area and intelligence, but not always. And it doesn't seem to be able to tell us whether an animal can or cannot do something. A landmark study in 2018 using modern technology found that the McLean brain model is completely false and outdated. Previously, people would look at the reptile brain and confidently say, nope, no, no neocortex, no limbic system, I can't see it, so they don't have it, so they can't do it. But this study looked closely at the cells and properties of the brain neurons and genes that govern these structures. They then directly compared what they found to the brains of mice, animals commonly used in research due to their similarity to ourselves, and lastly compared it to the human brain itself. They found that the areas on the pallium, this flat, squishy bit, contained structures specifically comparable to the mammal hippocampus and amygdala, showing evidence of things that are expected in the non-reptile limbic system that would process memory, learning and emotions. The researchers went further and found cells that were remarkably similar to unique cells found in the human neocortex, the outer part and advanced part of the McLean model, often tied with critical thought, thinking. This questions everything we previously thought about the brains of lower life forms. Their brains aren't primitive, or missing parts that we've newly developed in our own special evolutionary line. The structures that we have simply expanded from existing predefined precursors that reptiles already had and have had for many millions of years. The reptile neurologist at the Max Planck Institute who published this study had this to say. The differences between the brains of reptiles and humans seem largely overstated. But hold on, you can't compare all of these animals to each other, it's not right, we're far too different to them, you're anthropomorphizing. Well, no, anthropomorphism is applying human qualities to an animal. But we're not, these aspects already exist, I'm not choosing to apply them here. These are comparisons that are empirically shown by the biology itself. In fact, not discussing the mysterious qualities of their brains in comparison to others is like assuming that these animals are robotic, mechanical, predetermined in their abilities and able to be entirely placed on a blueprint with current science. That is something that may be more dangerous than anthropomorphism. Mechanomorphism. We'll discuss that in another video, but keep that word in mind. So why is comparing two different animals often considered anthropomorphism? Comparative anatomy is an entire subset of science. In fact, comparative neuroanatomy is a distinct branch of neuroscience that exists to compare the brain anatomy of different animals. Because evolutionarily, we are all mostly interlinked. We all share distant ancestors, meaning we share many biological similarities, especially in areas as early formed as the central nervous system. If we continue to look into studies and literature, we can see some remarkable abilities in reptile cognition. Reptiles will move into unsuitable areas to reach preferred food sources, while not doing this for more nutritious but less palatable sources, showing food pleasure. They will exhibit emotional fever, an increase in preferred body temperature when stressed, as well as an increased heart rate. Play behaviour is also well documented in lizards, crocodiles and turtles. I highly recommend checking out the evidence for this, it's mind blowing. Snakes are arguably affected more by our preconceptions than lizards. This may be because snakes diverge from our anatomy more so than lizards. For example, play behaviour has not been documented, but snakes are much more difficult to behaviourally judge because we are judging them on the capabilities of other animals or ourselves. Much like the proverbial fable of judging a goldfish by its ability to climb a tree. 
In truth, evidence shows that snakes are more evolutionarily advanced than most lizards. Their closest lizard ancestors are the incredibly intelligent monitor lizards in Varanus. Furthermore, if we begin to judge snakes by their own abilities rather than limitations, then a better picture forms. Snakes can learn to push buttons for food rewards and enact contingency plans if the button does not work. They can solve complex mazes with decreased latency each attempt, meaning they get better with practice. Snakes can live in family groups, show monogamous wild pairings, and complex social organisation. They can manipulate their environment by moving objects to create better strike avenues for ambushing prey, and follow the gaze of conspecifics and predators. In other words, snakes are incredibly complex and rely on more sensory cues than even we do. Here is a wonderful teaching parable used by neurologists and evolutionary biologists. A researcher is studying the behaviour of a very colourful lizard. When this lizard sees a person, it rapidly changes its colour to match its background, just as octopuses are well known to do. The researcher concludes that the change in colour is a cryptic response to avoid predation. Just at this time, however, a rattlesnake that is quietly observing the researcher from some nearby brush is suddenly spotted by the researcher, who is both startled and scared. Rattlesnakes, being pit vipers, can detect patterns of infrared radiation from mammals through the lorial pits situated between the eyes and nostrils. Therefore, when snakes perceive the researcher, she detects it as a very warm mammal, moving in a much cooler background, not unlike the way the human sees the colourful lizard. When the startled researcher saw the rattlesnake, adrenaline kicked in and the flow of blood to the arms and legs was reduced, along with all other peripheral circulation. This is a normal response to stress. The researcher turned cooler and was therefore less visible to the infrared detecting eyes of the snake. Our clever rattlesnake concludes that the person is trying to escape by matching the cooler background. The drop in peripheral temperature is a cryptic response to predators with heat sensing organs. This is an example of cratalomorphism by omission. For although there is evidence that predator stress can lower body temperature, the snake's conclusion would probably be dismissed as erroneous by most human scientists. Is the snake's conclusion different in any essential way from the conclusion of the human researcher studying the lizard? Arrogant assumptions are dangerous. We can't know the subjective experiences of animals, so the most accurate thing we can do is keep looking and comparing using empirical evidence until we know more, and indeed can replace our older knowledge over and over, assuming what reptiles can do can only be harmful to them. We do not understand what they are capable of, so shouldn't we give them the benefit of the doubt? Ultimately, we must provide the animals in our care with the best quality of life that we can, and the only way we can ensure we're on the right track is to understand their full capacity for thinking, range of emotions, and to admit that there is so much we do not yet understand. Wouldn't you want to be ahead of the curve in your animal husbandry? Thank you for watching, and please never stop learning.